So this is a um, Spitfire Mark 5C LF, so it's a, an early Mark Spitfire. Towards the end of the war it got relegated to training duties as it was really quite, um, quite top sleep by that point. And it survived the war uh, very fortunately and was given to Loughborough College uh, where they use it as an instructional airframe. So it was kept indoors and kept in extremely good condition until it was donated uh, to us um, I think the late 60s, uh, early 70s, and it had a restoration then. Fairly in depth, but um, you know, physically the aeroplane was all intact and, and in pretty good order. Well, it originally went into service with 310 Squadron, which was a Czech squadron. After it was um, clipped, it moved to a 312 squadron. Uh, they, they flew it in more combat missions at low level. It's said very often one of the great cliches that in 1940 Britain stood alone. It didn't. It still had one and only one ally, Poland. Poland was the only country which was invaded and occupied by the Germans, which did not, at the end, surrender, did not sign an armistice, never did a deal. It said, no, we're still at war with you. The government moved out and eight and a half thousand airmen. That was effectively a sovereign air force. And eventually it was realized, well, yes, all right, uh, it's the Polish Air Force, I'll fly under the operational control of the RAF, but we recognize their integrity as an air force, which is why, although they used the basic RAF uniform, the wings were Polish wings. The rank badges, would they had Polish rank badges as well as RAF rank badges, um, and very often they weren't the same. This aircraft uh, was flown in combat missions against the, the Luftwaffe, and they found towards the mid, the mid point of 1942, the Mark V just wasn't, um, wasn't fast enough to catch up with the, the German fighters of the time. So they moved more towards Mark IX's, and the Mark V's they, they um, put into sort of home duties, um, sort of gunnery practice, etc. I'm doing the annual inspection on the aircraft. It's the first one since it was rebuilt. Uh, so we have to look at the, the inside of it. So we're just taking the um, inspection panels off at the moment. It's made out of the same materials your modern airliner is today. It's exactly the same aluminium, same rivets. And they were designed to take damage in battle. So. They're fairly, fairly sturdy things, but they are made out of very thin aluminium. So you do have to be careful where you tread. If it's not dripping, it's empty. It's a uh, sort old aircraft. Obviously, we, you have to keep it down to a minimum. Um, and any, any excess we find after flight, if we find it's, um, it's used a little bit too much or there's a little bit too much spread down the aircraft, we'll obviously investigate um, to find the cause of that. Yeah, so the, the bolts themselves are special close tolerance bolts with the holes reamed out to suit that particular bolt size. Um, to a specific torque loading, so I'm just checking all the split pins are in place and that the bolts haven't obviously um, haven't moved. So what we've got is we've got um, some spin-on oil filters here. Um, it's actually a it's a modification to standard, but it improves the serviceability of the aircraft because um, you get added filtration from the, from the original filters. I was an apprentice here starting 10 years ago and uh, for part of my experience that I had to gain for the qualification I spent two years working on the rebuild of this aircraft until I moved on to a, a different project to gain different experience. It's not every day where you, well for us it is, but a lot of people don't get this when they come to work. They sit behind an office desk or 
or they're on a computer, whereas here we, we're working on uh, British history, so it's, it's quite nice. You're starting to lose the people that saw and lived through the, through the war, so to preserve its memory, you have to keep the aircraft in the air. So, I mean, the, the best way to preserve an aircraft, to keep it in as good a condition as possible, is to keep it in an airworthy condition. I remember climbing out of my, far off my very first flight, and uh, Stu Goldspink rolled up and said, this is just like a big chipmunk, isn't it? And which sort of put you in your place. I made my first flight, you know, when I was 45 or something, and, and uh, with uh, many thousands of hours of experience behind me. So it's not quite the same thing. Those guys, bearing in mind that they wouldn't know what a nosewheel aeroplane was, they would only have ever flown tail drag aeroplanes. And running up to the Spitfire, they would have flown either Hart trainer or a gladiator, uh, possibly a hurricane, or if they're coming through training, they may well have been flying the Harvard. So those, those young men have, would have flown something appropriate before they flew the Spitfire and been used to poor forward visibility. So the, um, the, the C wing had the option, because this is a Mark 5C, it had the option of um, having either the four Brownings um, or it could have one cannon and two Brownings or you could have two cannons which is a pretty heavy, heavy armament compared to four, four little machine guns. The wing sh structure is the same as, as the, the A-wing, however they had to reroute the aileron cables. So the ailerons on the Mark 5C are slightly stiffer than on a Mark 5A. Pilots say it's noticeable on the, on the stick, yeah. What we're looking for it's movement of that tungsten pad. They sort of display sideways. You should be able to see a tiny line between the, you know, the braised surface and the, and the pad itself. Also, um, give them a little tap as well, just to make sure they are. It's hidden. Yeah. yeah, make sure there's no movement. It's a shame, really. It's a really, it's a really good fix for them, but um, some seem to be prone to it, and others are, you know, completely fine. But um, what we have to do. About 13 years ago, um, the aeroplane was showing signs of age. Uh, it was built largely with magnesium oil rivets, which tend to pop. And so we brought it in for a major inspection and we just discovered there was a lot of rivets popping on it. And so the decision was made to, to completely strip it down, which we did do. And so it's been completely taken down to its component, smallest component. Every single rivet has been changed, every part dismantled, inspected um, and put back together. Um, what we're really pleased with is we've managed to keep 95% of the original structure is gone back in. There was a few wing skins, one skin on the fuselage, uh, tailplane skin, um, a few bits of obviously the fabric covering has been changed. Uh, and one spar has been changed, but it's retained the carry through spar, the leading edge, all the wing ribs. I want to have a good look at, at the spars um, because the aircraft was re this wing was re sparred um, wet during the restoration. So I want to have a good look at that to make sure nothing's moved in there. The spar is the, the main structural, um, well, it's the main structure of the wing, really. Everything hangs off the spar. So um, it passes, it's the full length of the wing. It passes through a center section spar into the other wing. So you don't want any damage on, the, on your spar. Um, the spars are repairable, but only, only the last few bays outboard due to its structure and how it's constructed.